So finally, from our <coughs> speakers panel, um, Simon Maxwell, I think you, you all know, um, but uh, currently speaking as a senior research associate <coughs> here and as a specialist advisor to Malcolm's committee. Thanks very much. Um, and I feel a bit like uh, either the King's Fool or uh, Ken Dodd as the only independent voice. I need a tickle stick in order to kind of be perhaps uh, provocative in this uh, discussion. I need to say that, uh, like probably everybody else in the room, I've either worked for DFID um, or would like to work for DFID or will work for DFID <laughs> or have taken money from DFID <laughs> or have friends in DFID um, or would like to have friends in DFID. Uh, so you should, you should understand that. I'm also, um, as has been said, a specialist advisor to the Select Committee, but of course don't speak for the Select Committee in any way um, and indeed speak as an independent here. Uh, I wrote a blog about this. It was fun to read the, the, the DAC report. You know, um, Eric and his colleagues are consummate diplomats. And if you're not a consummate diplomat, as I am not, you have to kind of take a pickaxe to the text in order to try and work out what exactly um, is, being, is being said. And, and I found this wonderful piece in the Harvard Business Review about when you're doing an appraisal of your colleagues, the ratio of positive to, to negative comments you're allowed to make. And I was trying to kind of disentangle those. And I came up with... With, with five questions that I thought were hidden in the report, and I want to say something briefly about uh, some of those, while recognising first that it's quite right, there is a great deal of well-deserved praise for DFID uh, in this report. Just by the way, today, as we speak, the House of Lords is passing, we hope, the third reading of the 0.7 bill, which means if there are no amendments, it can then go for royal assent, and this government will have delivered, uh, thanks to Michael Moore, um, who, uh, it's a private member's bill, will have delivered a, a legal commitment to 0.7, which is an astonishing achievement, actually, and opens up a whole new vista for international uh, development in the UK. So what are the five questions that I found hidden in the report? And when I've talked about those, you might want to ask, what are the questions that are not hidden in the report? Because there might be some others. Uh, first of all, and, and I think Eric made this point, does the UK, not DFID, but does the UK know where it's going on global development? Uh, secondly, is DFID gummed up by <coughs> targets, procedures, and transactions costs? Uh, thirdly, is DFID over-centralized? Uh, fourthly, has DFID overreached itself as a knowledge-led organization? And fifth, has DFID become a bit of a global bully? And I put those in my blog as forcefully as I could in order to open up uh, a discussion. And let me tell you what I think the answers are. And working from the bottom up, because actually the first question is probably the most important. Uh, has DFID become a global bully? Well, arrogance was the word that was used. Justified arrogance uh, <coughs> has been said. I do think the UK has a very difficult set of cards to play this, this, this year in particular and in general around the choreography of linking Sendai, disaster reduction, Addis Ababa finance for development, uh, New York Sustainable Development Goals and into Paris on climate. And actually, those diplomatic issues are probably the most important things DFID has to do this year. Getting those deals in Addis and in New York and in Paris particularly is a really difficult job when there is such a gap between the G77 plus China on the one hand and the G8 <coughs> on the other. Um, Malcolm talked in, in his remarks about the importance of having the right skills. Of course, if it needs skills in delivering aid, but not half as much as it needs skills in brokering global deals. Um, and that is true of the UK and true of all development agencies. And remind me to say something at the end about the ODI project on the development agency of the future, which tackles all this. I've written about the choreography of post-2015 on my website. I don't, of course, DFID shouldn't be arrogant, but my goodness, it needs to think globally and have the right skills, resources, and strategies uh, in place. Um, it would probably help not to keep lecturing people about 0.7, particularly in Brussels, uh, because 0.7 is going to be a really big ask for many European countries. And the challenge for, for the UK is to find other items to throw into the negotiating pot, um, like trade, science and technology, migration and so on, which I think could help to broker a deal. Has DFID overreached itself as a knowledge-led organization? Well, there is a lot, but a lot of it is global public goods, and I don't think Mark DFID should, should apologize in any way for investing in research. 
Um, the best investment you make is in is in think tanks like ODI, of course, and one or two other places. Um, <laughs> some people definitely think, uh, but the, the 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 challenge Diffid has, I think, is to is to find some way of making ICI, the NAO, uh, the Select Committee, and Diffid's own evaluation department uh, work together. You know, my own view is that each of these does a good job, but there's a lot of overlap. There's a slight lack of clarity of what the mandate is. It's really good news that the Cabinet Office reviewed ICI has given it an, a sort of overarching policy-led mandate for its next phase of work rather than looking so much at projects. And of course, it's great news that Alison Evans has been appointed as the new ICI Chief Commissioner and approved by uh, the Select Committee. But there is scope for rationalization. Is DFID over centralized? I have no view on that subject. Uh, if I was working in the field, I would certainly think it was over centralized. If I was working in London, I would think it wasn't. Um, and uh, I guess there's always a difficult balance. Is DFID gummed up by targets, procedures, and transactions costs? Well, uh, all of us see the transactions costs associated with business cases, logical frameworks, and so on with very complex reporting requirements, with results frameworks that require a great deal of measurement. Um, I know that DFID has gone through a whole procedure to try and simplify with a new smart rules um, approach, and it may well be that that problem is on the way to being solved. But I, if you haven't read it, do read Robert Chambers' diatribe on results-based issues. Just Google Robert Chambers and frogs. It's only a page or so, and I think, he makes a case that needs to be answered about the very high cost, uh, not just to those of us who work within the system, but also to recipients on the ground of some of the procedures. I come to the first question uh, that I had on my list. Does the UK know where it's going on global development? That is absolutely a fascinating question for current ministers, uh, for Justine Greening and her colleagues, and for uh, whoever is in post after the election uh, in May, and it's the question that the Select Committee spent some time um, addressing. Um, and without putting words into the Select Committee's mouth, I think at the beginning of the process, there was a genuine question about how well the UK handled the big cross-cutting issues of development which are becoming more and more visible. Uh, development is still about delivering good health care in Tanzania, or Nepal, but it's also and increasingly about dealing with the complex problems of fragile states which require military and diplomatic intervention and with delivering global public goods, whether it's an Ebola vaccine or action on climate change. And in each of these new spheres of action, you absolutely need cross-government working and a joined up whole of government approach. Is DFID, that was the question, the right way to do that? Why is it that no other country in the world has a unified development ministry for both policy and implementation? Would it be better to merge DFID back into the Foreign Office or handle things in other ways? The committee um, uh, heard a good defense from DFID, uh, but the DAC in its review concluded, and the committee agreed with this, that DFID is good tactically but not good strategically. Uh, that it, 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 if you look at things that Justine and her colleagues have done, girls, for example, and FGM have been great successes. Of course, it's been great to have David Cameron showing the lead on issues like uh, the successor to the MDGs. But there's a whole range of issues, and we had a record number of, of evidence submissions to this inquiry by the IDC. And Malcolm and I are probably, along with Chloe Challenger, the only three people in the world who've read all the written submissions. There was also a lot of um, um, frustration at the fact that there were big issues about the way the global economy works for poor people that were not as evident as they should be in the HMG approach. Issues about migration, issues about drugs, um, issues, of course, about tax and transparency and illicit financial flows, which feature very um, heavily in this report. And the question that then arose was, how should these be handled in the future? Uh, and we looked at what other countries do. Many of them have policy coherent strategies. They have government-wide public service agreement type uh, objectives. Uh, they have parliamentary rapporteurs in the European Parliament, for example, who deal with these policy coherence issues. Um, and as Malcolm has said, the view of the, the MPs on the committee was that, they, that, that the government could up its game in this area uh, and then that would be useful. And then finally that leaves us with a challenge for what comes after the election. Um, in reviewing the work, the, in reviewing what's available, I think the committee came to some important conclusions 
um, and Malcolm has mentioned some of them. The 2002 and 2006 acts are no longer fit for purpose. Uh, both will need to be reviewed. Uh, the former in order to make sure that there is a really strong overarching poverty focus across all the aid and policy work of HMG in development, including the 10% plus of ODA that is spent by other government departments. The 2006 Transparency and Reporting Act, because it deals entirely with the MDGs and will need to be reformulated to deal with the SDGs. Um, DFID needs a wider mandate across Whitehall to act as the conscience and Rottweiler dealing with these global issues, uh, including global economic issues uh, like tax and trade and transparency. Um, and um, it will need a new set of instruments, whether spillover analysis or um, uh, 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 impact reviews, in order to be able to make sure that it has the authority to, to intervene on policy at the appropriate moments. And of course, it will need parliamentary accountability adjusted to max match, and it will need the skills and capacities in-house. So there is a big change agenda facing DFID. An obvious vehicle is to have a white paper soon after the election. But I think the committee concluded, and it's certainly in my view, that with New York and Paris on the horizon, it would be sensible to wait until the beginning of next year for a major reorganization. But when that moment comes, and when the changes recommended in the white paper have been implemented, DFID will not look like the DFID we have today. For all the successes and all the praise, uh, the challenge to DFID, which is embedded in all these reports, is to go through a really substantial change process. And if it wants to continue as the independent government cabinet level department on international development, it will really need our support uh, and political support to make sure that it can exert its authority right across government so that HMG truly is strategic, that beyond aid issues are embedded in DFID's results frameworks. I think there is a radical agenda ahead in development. Uh, I, you know, having worked in this business for 40 odd years, mainly focusing on aid, the next 40 years won't be about aid. They won't be about 0.7. We want DFID to be in the forefront in that new agenda as it has been in the old. Thank you, Simon. And can I thank all the speakers for keeping to time. Before we open up um, the um, uh, questions, uh, to the floor and to the wider audience. Um, does anyone want to respond to what's that fairly fundamental point, I think, which Eric made in his report, which is referred to in the uh, Development Committee's report and um, which Simon has just highlighted, which is this uh, question of the strategic um, relationship between DFID and aid issues and other policies and departments of government. It seems to me that's quite fundamental. and. Um, Part of the answer is, is, a, is a structural one, but uh, how best um, do you think, or, or uh, Mark, maybe we could start with you, how do you get that buy-in and that cross-departmental working um, more effectively, <coughs> um, especially as we move beyond aid? Um, well, I do, I do sort of question a bit of the premise, actually. I mean, the... Um, the construct we have in the government is not that um, DFID is supposed to do everything on development. That is not the construct. Um, the construct is um, the government sets out its, um, uh, takes you know, decisions and has discussions on its overall external policy through the National Security Council, which talks about the development challenges and then a variety of government bodies have various responsibilities for that. Um, and I think um, what we've seen over the last, especially the last decade, but including over the last five years, has been a broadening of responsibility of government departments other than DFID, including um, you know, successive prime ministers, including David Cameron, have um, played very strong personal roles in um, the forward development agenda. So... Um, I'm, you know, the future governments will decide the relative roles of DFID versus other bits of government. But the construct we've had has not been that development is only DFID's job. In fact, what we've seen is more and more departments being drawn into bits of the development agenda and structures across government designed and um, resourced and sort of... Um, processes set up to reinforce that. 
Now, you can have a debate about whether for any particular policy issue you like the outcome the government collectively has got to. But that's a different question. Um, so, um, I, I do, all I, all I want to say on this really is um, <coughs> let's make sure we start the debate from where we actually are as opposed to um, some not always well understood belief about where we are. Thank you. Eric, you thought this was an area that could perhaps be strengthened, um, bringing in the development dimension to the broader work of government. Yeah. <coughs> I will be very reluctant to go into how the UK government should organize itself because I'm simply not uh, competent uh, to do that. But if, if, I, if I make comparisons between different nations, I think it's a lot more about leadership than about system. Uh, the number one issue is to make certain that the prime minister after the election, whether it's David Cameron or Ed Miliband or whoever is the prime minister, has this high on the agenda because there is no one else who can really bring an all, I mean, all government approach. I mean, whoever, whatever, and brilliance or defeat, it cannot really bring the all of government approach. That can only be done uh, at, at the prime minister's level. And if you have a prime minister who is not engaged in development issues, it's very hard. And if you look around Europe, you will see a huge number of prime ministers who never give a thought uh, to development and then there will be very little integration of this in government policies. Second issue is to make certain that whoever is the Secretary of Development, or if it's more integrated with the foreign uh, policy, I mean the foreign minister, uh, is a strong politician who can take a lead. Because that's what's really uh, uh, influencing it. And, uh, and look to what was the reality of the world. Uh, there is not one single development minister anywhere in the world have lasted for more than a little bit more than two years. If you take the Nordic nations, I mean, the Nordic nations are among the potential leaders uh, of the world. Norway, my nation, don't even have a development minister at the moment. Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, all three have had three different ministers within the last 18 months. Uh, nothing wrong with any of them as individuals, but for sure you cannot lead with that rotating circus. Uh, you, you take time to get into it, you get into the ministry and, well, you don't know anyone in Washington or in Beijing or in Brussels, you don't know the issues on, on your plate, even if you are very good, it takes time. Uh, so leadership is absolutely key. And if you get leadership wrong, you cannot replace that with go good systems. So you, you, while you would need to put in place the best systems uh, and you would know better how that is done, uh, I will just emphasis, uh, uh, put emphasis on, on the issue of leadership. Thank you. Malcolm, any points on, to um, make on only that? A, only a couple, because I think they've been made. It's just that from the committee's point of view, I mean, it's just the way Parliament and the government works. We mm. operate in silo ministries. We monitor DFID. ICAI has a slightly broader brief because it monitors ODA wherever it is. Uh, but it reports to us, I suppose that gives mm. us a connection. Um, but, for example, when we were trying to look at this beyond aid, we did ask the National Security Advisor to give evidence, and he declined, uh, even though he's the advisor to the National Security Committee, which is, if you like, the area where coherence um, should be manifested. Secretary of State's a member of that, ex officio, that's chaired by the Prime Minister. We get an opportunity to ask questions of the Prime Minister, amongst others, in the liaison committee, but there isn't quite the same opportunity to, to get that coherence. But I do agree also, in the end of the day, political will and leadership is more important than structure. In the end, I do accept that, but nevertheless, if you have the right to get evidence from different departments, I, I just don't want to malign all mm. departments. We do get um, both civil servants and sometimes ministers from some other departments, like foreign affairs and defence, will appear in front of the committee. But not every department will, but we have had over Sierra Leone, we've got somebody from the Department for Health. So it's getting better. Uh, but the fundamentals are ministers are required, effectively, to reply to their own committee. They're not required to reply to other committees, so it does, does create a slight obstacle. But I, th I think you can over-egg it. Okay. Thanks very much. You, you're the one that asked the question, so <laughs> or, or put the question. Okay, just quickly then. Well, I think, it's, I, think I, I would not myself say that the construct to use Mark's word, is that DFID does everything. We're not going to send peacekeeping troops to Central Africa with DFID badges on their lapels. The issue is 
when we have this leadership, how do we know that the right things are being done by the right people and who holds the pen in that appraisal process? And the role that is being discussed for DFID is not to have soldiers in, on the ground or to do all the other things that they're doing, but to make sure that those things are being done and they are coherent and consistent. Okay, right. So it's uh, over to you. Usual um, rules apply. Say who you are and what your affiliation um, uh, is. And um, speak as clearly as you can and as briefly as you can uh, so we can get uh, as many people in as possible. And if you've got specific questions to specific panellists, then uh, make that clear as well. I'd like to go first. <laughs> 